last week, and we're starting a series called Live Free. And so we want to discover what uh, what Paul is, is ministering to the Church of Galatians, and then how he enforced or encouraged them to live a life of freedom. So this morning we're going to be in Galatians chapter 2. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. I'm using uh, the NIV. I also got a few verses in the message, and I said, well, maybe you know, I'll throw in the ESV there this week, but um, I'm mostly focusing on the uh, passage, Galatians chapter 2. So we're in Galatians chapter 2, and here, uh, last week we talked about Paul being a uh, minister of the gospel, and he said, hey, you guys have turned to another gospel, and we looked back in the book of Acts and said, what is, what is the message of the gospel? What is it that Paul was sharing that he, he thought it was so important that others not change it? And that was that Jesus is the Son of God, that he was buried, and he, was, and he rose again for the remission and removal of our sins. He said, cannot change that gospel. And so he continues in chapter 2, he's going to continue kind of this conversation of the, the gospel and what it is, what it is that, that he's sharing with other people, and particularly uh, making sure that his message, the message that he's sharing, lines up. So let's read in Galatians chapter 2, we're going to read verses 1 through 5 to start with, and we're going to go through the whole chapter this morning. And I got really excited as I was reading it this week, just the different things that are in it. And I don't know if you've ever uh, maybe had to prepare a message, whether it was in class or for a Sunday morning or a gathering or something. Um, but there's always more things that you want to say than what you can at the time allotted. Like, okay, you've got the, your dissertation you're working on, you've got like thousands of pages of stuff, and you're like, okay, i got to reduce it down to this, this page limit. This morning was one of those mornings. I thought there is so many. I could go verse by verse, like word by word, and we could break down things. But we're we're going to go and, and and make it through because I think there's a consistent theme in this chapter. But let's read Galatians chapter two, verse one through five. It says then, after fourteen years, I went up again to Jerusalem. This time with Barnabas, I took Titus along also. I went in response to the revelation and meeting privately with those esteemed as leaders. I presented to them the gospel that I preached among the Gentiles. I wanted to be sure I was not running, and had not been running, my race in vain. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. This matter arose because some false believers had infiltrated our ranks and to spy on the freedom that we have in Christ and to make us slaves. We did not give up, or give up or give in to them for a moment, so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. So again, this is uh, Paul's whole mission here, was that the truth of the gospel would be preserved. That I'm not going to let anything uh, change this message. Not even, he said in the last chapter, right? not even if angel appears to you, don't let them convince you of something other than what we've preached to you. If they, if they say something different, dismiss it. And again, he says, we went up to Jerusalem because we desire to preserve the message of the gospel. We want to make sure that check, check this uh, gospel. So let's focus in a little bit in, in here. The key, one of the key words, because we're talking about living free, in verse number four, it talks about uh, it says this, the matter arose because some believers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom that we have in Christ Jesus and to make us slaves. Again, there's this freedom that we're talking about here as we looked at the book of Galatians, this freedom between the works of the law. So if I were to uh, believe in the works of the law, I would believe that the things that I do would make me right before God. So hey, if I were to um, sacrifice this way, or to behave in this way, it is these things that I do would make me right before God. However, the gospel is contrary to that. It says it's not the things that I do. Actually, the things I do, it makes it impossible for me to stand right before God. However, it's now the message 
that we're given here is that it's through Jesus, what he's done perfectly, that we live right. But this freedom in Christ that we have is not a freedom for us to, to live our own way. How do we know that? In Romans chapter 6, verse 1, again, Paul is talking about the grace of God, that this gift of Jesus given. He says we should, in uh, Romans chapter 6, verse 1, should we keep, he says, should we keep on sinning? And he says, by no means. We are those, the, those, who us, those of us that are believers, we are those who have died to sin. So the freedom we have in Christ is not a, a freedom just to uh, throw off all the chains, to be rebellious in our ways and go do whatever we find pleasure in, but uh, the freedom that we have, we'll find out in the later verses, the freedom that we have is to live under Christ. So he, he doesn't want them uh, to, does not want to give in, um, sorry. Yeah, so we don't, he doesn't want to give in to these others. So the, the, this, con, this conflict is the others had come in and had forced people to be circumcised, to follow the law, to be the demonstration of the law. They said it's not good enough just to believe in faith, but you must add other things to your life. Said, no, we want to preserve the main message of the gospel, the good news. And that is, as, as if you've been here for a while, you know that the good news is who Christ is, his character, his identity as the Son of God, and what he's done for me. That's the good news of the gospel. That is the, the gospel message of who, who Jesus is and what he's done for me. He lived a life that was perfect. He was the, the God-man. He was born in the flesh. And he lived a life that was perfect. And he paid the price that you and I couldn't pay. And the law, if we, if we use some basic, um, small summary, this is, this is one, of those, uh, one of those words that I was like, man, I could spend a whole sermon just on what the law was, covering all the different commands. But I said, uh, to sum it up, just every time we mention the law or the works of the law throughout this chapter, we're thinking about the sacrifices or traditions or morality, things I'm trying to do good the good things. And have you ever heard, oh, that's, a, that's a, a good thing for a Christian to do, or, hey, they're such a nice Christian, you know, it, the, the works of law is somebody that's trying by their, the things that they do to make themselves right with God. So as we focus on these details, so here's this, there's these details of the freedom, details of the message of the gospel, there's also another kind of overarching um, story going on in this chapter. And we're going to read now verses 6 through 10 to see there's, all, there's another there's story here of preserving the gospel, but there's another theme here that's really important. So let's read 6 through 10. It says, As for those who are held in high esteem, whatever they were makes no difference to me. God does not show favoritism. So this is really important. Paul is, Paul is going back to Jerusalem because he wants to meet with Peter and with John and the leaders of the, the church in Jerusalem, he thought he, it was important for him to go and to present his message, right? In verse um, 2 it says, or in 2 it says that make sure he's not running in vain, he's not saying the wrong message. So he's going to them, he says, even though I'm going to them, I know that we're all equal. This is, not, this is a value that we want to establish at Capital City Church, and I, I believe we're continuing to establish, is that we're all equal. And Pastor Bob and myself, we don't think of ourselves higher than you, that we get some special um, message from God, that we are all the body of Christ. We are all the sons and daughters of God. And so we can hear the voice of the Spirit. So the Spirit lives inside of us, and He can speak to He can speak to one of you, and He can say, hey, Pastor, come here. I was, I was reading the Word this week, and this was encouraging to me. We want to encourage that for each one of you. There's nothing special about the position of the pastor as far as something that I get extra than any other believer. You guys all have the Spirit of God inside of you, and the Spirit of God can speak to you. This is for me. So he says, he says this um, in six. He says we held we held them in high esteem. They still held them in regard. They are leaders of the church. So he said, hey, we're holding them in high esteem, but we know that they're equal with us. They hear the same message we do, and there's not going to be a difference. So God does not show favoritism. On the contrary, they recognized that I had been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been to the circumcised. For God, who was at work in Peter as an apostle to the circumcised, was also at work as an apostle to the Gentiles. 
James, Cephas, or Peter, and John, those established as pillars, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship. When they recognized the grace given to me, they agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and to the circumcised, and they to the circumcised. Verse 10 says, All they asked was that we should continue to remember the poor, the very thing I had been eager to do all along. And when I was reading this passage, I was I, I kind of made, made my view of uh, Paul even like even greater. So Paul had been a minister at this point, he said, for 14 years. He had been sharing the message of the gospel. He had been planting churches. He had been seeing life change, people getting saved, water baptized, filled with the Holy Spirit. It, his ministry had already been established. There was already life change happening as he went and shared the gospel with other people. But he said, after 14 years, I wanted to make sure that the message that I had, because other voices were trying to tell me, hey, you know, you need to add this to it, you need to add this message. He said, no, I wanted to make sure that the message that I received from Jesus is the right one. So I'm going to go approach these leaders, the people that I have held high esteem, and I'm going to share my message with them and make sure everything that I'm doing lines up. This is a for me, an important underlining theme in, in Galatians is the, this, uh, this desire that Paul had, even as one that had been commissioned by God, to live in line with his authority. He said, I want to make sure that my life, what I'm preaching, what I'm living, lines up with the truth. And so at, at Capital City Church, man, we, we love living life together. We say that uh, often. We want to live life together. Why do we want to live life together? Why? Why is it important that we say, hey, we're a body of Christ, we're not just individuals out running around Madison trying to live for Jesus? It's, it's for this very reason that Paul went before the leaders in the church. He said, hey, I want to make sure that I'm not running in vain. I want to make sure that my life is aligned with this, that this is the message of the gospel. And so I, as I was reading this, I said, I, I've got to bring out this point that it's important for us as believers to live life together, to live life under, underneath authority so that if we can see where our lives line up with the message of gospel, or where they're off. Now I'm hoping, I, I, I mention this a lot in our missional community, but I, I mentioned, hey, as I'm teaching this, I need you guys also to, to speak this into my life, because I know sometimes you may notice maybe an interaction I have with a neighbor, or an interaction I have with my wife, or maybe even one of the, one of the members of the Bible study, or one of the members of the church, hey, Andrew, that, that didn't line up with the gospel. Andrew, when you, when you said that, when you did that, that wasn't a demonstration of Jesus. We need that in our lives. And Paul was one that understood the necessity of living within a body, living underneath authority, so that, hey, somebody could call, guard my life, because we know that sin is deceitful. One of the most humbling things is, is knowing that, that sin is deceitful. I could be deceived. I could be thinking I'm doing the right thing and be deceived. And I need my brothers and sisters, I need the Holy Spirit to live inside of me so that, hey, I could be called out so that my life would align with the message that, of the gospel that I'm sharing. I'm, I, I desire, we desire that our lives reflect the message of Jesus. And I believe that's true. If we get the message right, you know, we've been talking about the gospel for those that have been here over the last year, we've talked about the gospel almost every message now. And we say, if we get the gospel right, if we get the message right, our life will be right. If we believe the right thing, our lives will reflect the right thing. And so that's why this, this is so important. And that's why Paul understood it. He said, I know that if, if my message is right, my life is going to be right. And that's why um, Peter, he adds um, at the end, in verse 10, he says, and, and they wanted to, all they asked is that we should continue to remember the poor, the very thing that he was eager to do all along. See, the message had so changed who Paul was. The message is that the Father God loved us while we were sinners, while we were wrong, he loved us. And while he loved us, he sent his son, he paid the ultimate price on our behalf. And so when we begin to understand that our lives, we begin to live our lives differently. We begin to identify with others that are in the same position that we were in. Wow, they're, they're in that position of brokenness. They're in that position of bondage. They're in that position. They, they have a weak position. And usually sometimes, you know, if I'm honest, I might, 
on my, on my worst days, probably sometimes even on my best days, I tend to ignore the fact that God gave me a great blessing that I didn't deserve, and I need to also be able to give that to others. And Paul and Peter was saying, hey, you've been given a great blessing. Make sure that you also bless others. Make sure that you remember the poor. That's the, the statement there. Remember what has been done to you. Remember the message. Let it affect how you live out your life around other people. Remember the poor. So if we get the message right, our life will be right. The way we treat others, the way we act, the way we, the way we do business, the way we live our life in our, in our home, with our family, the way we treat our neighbors, everything is going to be right if we get the message right. This is the importance here. So then it, then it goes to the flip side. So this next uh, portion of, it, of, of um, verses is kind of the flip of this. So first is Paul saying, hey, come before Peter and the, and the leaders. He said, hey, uh, make sure my, my message is right. I want to make sure I'm not doing anything in vain. I want to be all right. And they said, yeah, I, we believe that the message you have is the message that Jesus shared. Go and continue to, to preach. And then let's see what happens here in verse 11. Um, and we're going to go through 14. It says this, When Cephas, also his name, uh, W. Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his faith, because he stood condemned. Some pretty serious words by Paul. For before certain men came from, from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in his, in his hypocrisy, so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. When, they, when I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in front of them all, You are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it? then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs. So, like I said, sometimes when I read Jesus' words, it's kind of like the snack down words. Kind of, he doesn't, he doesn't ship post stuff, he just says it as this sometimes. Here's another moment here, Paul now is being like, hey, hey Peter, remember the meeting that we just had? I mean, we just had this meeting, and he said, the method that we have is great, the grace that you've been given to preach the, to the uncircumcised, all those non-Jewish, basically, anybody who's not Jewish. He said, now you're here, you've been associating with us, but I see this, I see this glaring difference in your life. I see this, this, this thing that's not quite right in your life. Like I said, if we get the message right, then our life is going to run right. And he noticed Peter's life, there's something that's off. Now all of a sudden you're not associating with each other. What? What? This is a big deal. It's because this is later Paul in another book in Ephesians, we can we can go there in a little bit. In Ephesians uh, 4 15, he says that we should speak the truth in love, and we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ Jesus. So here he has an opportunity. He just allowed somebody to speak into his life. Now he's going to be able to speak into somebody else's life. He's going to speak into Peter's life and say, hey, I want to speak some truth to you, Peter, to make sure that you're going to continue to grow in maturity so that we can be built up into Christ because the message of Christ is of the most important thing. It's the most important. We have to get this right. Didn't we just agree? We just agreed that this message is the same. Now you're, now you're doing something different. They were not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. We have to be careful in our life that we don't also fall into the trap that the works that we do justify us. I was trying to think of different things. Even sometimes, Paul mentioned, or Peter mentions to care for the poor, but sometimes even in our caring for the poor, we're trying to justify ourselves. We're trying to make ourselves right. We're trying to do something in order to make ourselves feel better or look better before God. See, God, didn't you see how I gave that money away to this person? Didn't you see how I sacrificed my time in this moment? As if somehow that's going to better our position with the Lord. And the Lord says, 
what Paul is saying in this message is that no, there's nothing that you can do. Your acts are not worth what you think they're. They're not going to do anything for you. But the grace of God, what He has done, the life that Jesus lived, that is the better work. That is the greater work. That is the greater thing that we can put our faith in and say, hey, I, I can't do this. Jesus, I receive what you have done. But yet, here you are again, Peter. You're, you're trying to enforce works over the grace of God. It's not good. Not good, Peter. See, in Romans 3.23, it says, All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. No matter what we do, it's not going to be enough. Nobody can justify themselves. Nobody can make them right before God in their own effort. It's impossible. Let's read uh, 17 through 18 here. Verse 18 of uh, Galatians chapter 2 it says, But if in seeking to just to be justified with Christ, we choose to find ourselves also among the sinners, doesn't that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. If I rebuild what I destroy, then I really would be a lawbreaker. Like, oh no, what is, what is it? So sometimes um like reading the Romans, you know, reading some of Paul's writings, and he gets he uses a lot of these words, and I'm like, okay, I need to I need to break this down. And so I'm not uh, I'm not ashamed of reading the Message Bible of Romans Paul because I like sometimes the paraphrases and kind of reword things help me help me to, uh, to, continue to continue to understand things. But so I want to read these verses here again. And I want to read them in the Message. Because as I read 17 through 18, I'm, there's some complex thoughts here, and I'm like, okay, let me help, help me get this uh, in my simple brain sometimes. So let's do this. I want to read in the message version, I want to read 17 through 18. It's going to really, I think, pop our eyes to understand what Paul is saying here. It says this Have some of you noticed that we are not yet perfect? No great surprise, right? And are you ready to make the accusation that since people like me, who go through Christ in order to get things right with God, aren't perfectly virtuous? So he's saying, he, this is a contrast, remember, it's a contrast between those that do the works a lot, they try to justify themselves, and those who say, by faith, I'm going to be justified. Because that people like me, those who want to who believe by faith, go through Christ in order to get things right with God, aren't perfectly virtuous. Christ must therefore be an accessory to sin. They're noticing those who try to follow the law, they kept on breaking the law still. They still didn't get it right. He said, well now you that have, we that have faith in Jesus, we're still not perfect either. Does that mean that Jesus is an accessory? To our sin. The accusation is frivolous. It is absolutely not. Jesus is not an accessory to our sin. He doesn't come along with us in our sin. He doesn't, he doesn't promote the sin that we're doing. He doesn't promote the breaking of the law. He doesn't, he doesn't promote our, our flesh. That's us. If, if I was trying to be good, this is really good, guys. If I was trying to be good, I would be rebuilding the same old barn that I tore down. I would be acting as a charlatan. So if I was trying to be good, he's saying, if I'm trying to be good, if I'm trying to do this on my own, then I'm just rebuilding, it's, it, the message says, same old barn, I'm just rebuilding the law. I'm just making a new law for me. I entered into Christ, I entered in by faith, and now I've made all these rules for myself, because I'm trying to build myself a new law. He said, that it doesn't work. That's good. I would be trying to rebuild the same barn that I tore down. It's crazy to do that. Yeah. And sometimes in our own efforts, we said, man, I, I entered into Jesus, I entered into the gospel by faith, but now yeah. it's by my good works, it's about how good I'm going to be that I'm going to sustain it. Yeah. He said, Paul's like, it doesn't work. 
Peter, that's not the message you're going to be sharing with the Jews. That's not the message that Jesus delivered. Peter, no, they do not have to follow the circumcision laws. No, they do not have to follow this thing because it's not by those things in which we are made right with God. It's by our faith in Jesus Christ, the perfect work that he did, that now we're made right. We want to make it, sometimes we want to make it the morality, this is like our morality, right? The things that we do good. We, we sometimes act like the morality, is, and being nice and being a good, good person is like the cornerstone of what it means to be a Christian. But that's not. It's who God is and what he's done for us that then changes us. I'm not a good Christian because I'm here on Sunday morning. That doesn't, this building doesn't make me a Christian. What Jesus has done for me makes me a Christian, makes me a follower of him, makes me a love son of God, right? And so I put my faith in what he's done and not what I've done. It changes things. We've got to have a little different of a mindset. Now, it doesn't mean, you know, I, I've noticed, sometimes I notice when we, when we say things like that, like, hey, it's not Sunday morning that makes you a Christian, then everybody begins to not come on Sunday morning because, hey, Sunday morning, but not. This is an important time for us to equip and encourage you to continue to live for God, you know. Um, but like, you know, Pastor John fishing this morning. That's okay. Every once in a while, we've got, we got time away. We're going to, he's still going to gather with the body on Wednesday night and be encouraged and be around the Word, you know. So I'm not going to promote vacations every weekend, okay. I think I still, we will still want to maintain a Sunday morning gathering. So that we can be encouraged and build up, right? But the point is that coming here on Sunday morning does not make you right with God. But it encourages you, it equips you to continue to live right. Yes, that's it. Okay.
wow. Thank you, God, that you do have, you, you do bring your word, and your word brings correction to me, it brings rebuke, it brings encouragement. It shows me, basically, that I need God. That I couldn't do it on my own. That apart from Him, I could do nothing. It's the, the, the life is, without Him, is, is nothing. It's, it's failure, it's brokenness, it's, it's incomplete. And it, the word reminds me of that, so that I live in God. As we look in Galatians, we're going to continue looking in Galatians, um, that this aspect of being crucified with Christ. So my desires, who I am, the things I want to do, the, the good works that I try to do, those things have been crucified, those things die away so that I may live by Christ. How do we do that? We're going to look in the rest of Galatians and talk about the Spirit of God that comes in us and enables us to live like Christ. Because if we read the rest of these verses, it says, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So I have been crucified with Christ. Now, literally, have we all died and been crucified with Christ? No, I think mean, those in this room are very much alive. You know, do some pulse checking. But they were very much alive. But he says, this, this figurative speech is talking about the flesh, the, who we are, our desires, are all have been passed away, and they live now, my desire, my, my, my soul, my spirit, everything within me, now it lives for Christ. Those who have made the decision to follow Christ in faith. The old is, right, the, the other passage, right, the old has passed away in Corinthians, and the new has come. Now we have a new life in Him. Our desires and who we are changes. And I begin to look more and more like who God is. That's the journey of a believer. I cannot keep the law. I can't do it. It teaches me that I can live for Christ. I've been crucified with Christ. My identity has died. Who I am is gone. And the works of, now I receive the works of Christ. The life of Christ is so important. That's why the gospel message, it doesn't just... Um, until the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. It also includes a life of him. Because now, when I think about how do, how do I live, how such do I live, I say, wow, the, look at the life of Christ. And I say, man, I want to receive that life. I want to receive how he lived, that I may act and do just as he did. Verse 20. Uh, 21, sorry. It says this. I do not set aside... The grace of God. Right? Grace, here we, we can talk about good good church words, grace we may have that.